Hello and welcome to part two of my video on Joy Division and Martin, particularly Martin Hannett's production techniques. So, a couple of notes on the kind of Joy Division light track I've recorded as a demo on here. I've overdubbed two basses on top of each other. You might find that the twanginess of a baritone guitar works in that register. I don't have a baritone guitar. Uh, I'm using round wound strings on there. I'm sure that's not what Peter Hook used, but it doesn't matter to me. I'm just basically using two basses together and seeing what comes out there. Uh, the concept of two basses, whatever the actual instrument, opens up a lot of possibilities. Not just doing pseudo Peter Hook kind of things. Let's have a listen to the drums without effects. So I'm going to take off the effects on here. I'm also going to mute. I'm going to mute some of the guitar and what have you. Okay, let's. This is what we have. In fact, we have an echo on here. Right, so talk you through some of the some of what's going on on here. Um, we have the overhead mics. Now what I've done on here is uh, first of all let's save the effects off. Overhead mics. So First thing I put them through is Green Ringer, which is, in fact, I did another video about guitar distortion pedals. It's one of Air Windows oddities, uh, modeled off the octave pedal. Um, but then what I've done is I've put this through, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this. Teufselberg Reverb. Okay, sorry, I'll just uh, mute the keyboard on here. Teufselberg Reverb. So what that is, is it's uh, NSA Listening Tower in Berlin, which I couldn't not use it for a Joy Division video. Essentially, it seems like the perfect thing, so here it is. So that's just on the right channel it should be coming out as on your system. And I'm also using one of the Brycasty um, plates on here on the other channel. So I'll switch that on now. So one in each channel and it kind of gives an impression of an acoustic space. Okay, now, next thing I'm gonna take you through is we've got voltage modular on here. It's not triggering just now. So this is the, the synth snare. Basically, triggering at the same time as the acoustic snare, which I'm going to bring up. You can kind of tuck them together. Now I've done the same thing. I'm going to mute some of these drum tracks. Probably hear the synth kick there. So I've got that triggering at the same time, and I've got a slight bit of attack going on, so that the there's not two 
attack. So you can see that the synth kick is kicking in slightly after the acoustic kick does. Okay, let's switch some of these on. The snare. Okay, so moving on to the next effect that I've got going on on the guitar. Very simple on here. What I've done is taken purest fade, I'll just move this up. Purest fade, taken modulation, clicked it on on there and put it to 0.5 of a quarter note, so that's on eighth notes. And when the guitar is playing, it kind of comes through like a synth effect. So, we've, we've doubled up the kick, we've doubled up the, the snare on there. Um, just for one second, I'll just show you on the, this is not the snare, this is in fact the kick, here we go, so we've got two cutoffs, well in fact three cutoffs because we've got the main can play with those cuts off levels and tune your snare quite nicely. So, now, the main effects that Hannett used were the aforementioned AMS and the Marshall Time Modulator. Both of these can be used to produce modulation effects like flanging, phasing and chorusing as well as wonky warped record sounds that you can hear on lots of instruments especially on closer on the on the toms i've used a 12 millisecond delay um i'm gonna give you a listen to what that sounds like it's coming up in just one moment So that's the drums by themselves. So you can do the maths on here and work out exactly exactly what delay time is in tune with your track. I found that 12 milliseconds was completely in tune with mine. I've used a bit of Air Windows Chorus. Um, here I've got it kind of mixed together. Um, on other tracks, I've used it by itself. Um, I'll give you an example. I think it's it's there's quite a bit of it on... I quite like the uh, the wonky kind of tuning that he does on there. So there are there are VST effects available which do model both the Marshall Time Modulator and the AMS Digital Reverb. Um, they're both chargeable, so. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna recommend them A B recommend anybody does anything illegal in order to obtain them and see let's see if we can do the same things in the public domain.
Okay, so one thing which I've got set up on here is a dub. Kind of reverb. Now what I've done in the... Whoops. In the loop, I'll show you the, uh, I'll show you this effect here. D shift. Now this is a, a pitch shifter and you can see I've in fact set it on a random LFO so that each time through the effects loop it's sometimes shifting upwards, sometimes shifting downwards. I think it gives a nice wave effect and this is something again that Martin Alec used to use. So. Another effect, <laughs> another effect which, let's, let's take the, let's take the high bass on here, and I'm going to show you Martin Eastwood Audio, it's another Martin, which must be a sign, and his duet. You may be able to hear that there. Maybe a bit too much on the deck. Definitely too much on the deck. So what duet does is it gives you a... Uh, not just doubled effect, but a tripled effect. And... Each of them is detuned. You can set up to 50 cents detuning, but also modulate the depth of the detuning. So it's very similar to a chorus effect, but it's subtly different. So Hannett took dub effects, feeding the mixing desk back onto itself with effects in the loop to create to create whole new kind of like worlds, basically. But his, his mixing style was based in dub. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means that the mixes that he was doing First of all, was spacious, and the primary the primary interplay that was going on in the instrumentation was between the bass and the drums. They're the foundation of everything in dub and in much of the music that Martin Hannett recorded. Um, I've gone with instruments which probably Joy Division at least if not had access to. I've used emulations of them. So first of them is Samples of the ARP Omni. There's a lot of these around. Um, 
any kind of string machine sample will work. Um, and the other one on here is one that I've in fact just started using today. Uh, it's a VST version of the Transcendental 2000, um, including the nice kerning on the fonts on there. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, the Transcendental 2000 was a kick-based synthesizer. You could build it week by week by sending off for the or subscribing to the magazine. And after, I think, two years, you would end up with one of these synthesizers. Bernard Sumner of uh, Joy Division built one, and they used it. Uh, first of all, on Unknown Pleasures, and then, of course, on Closer. Uh, so, I think this is quite a fun emulation. So there's not much difference between the Transcendental and most synths of the era. It's, it's monophonic, it's got envelopes for filter, for, for modulation, you can, you can, it's got quite a nice amount of control on there, but you can probably do the same things with another synth. Because we're doing a video about Joy Division, this is the one I'm using on here. So let's just have a listen to that kind of up loud. So I've got that feeding into the kind of dub delay system that's got a that's got a pitch shift algorithm on there as well so let's recap some of the main things the way that Joy Division made their music was built to have a lot of space in there Oh, that's very loud. Uh -huh. I'll reduce that down. As I was saying before, I was uh, so rudely interrupted by the uh, by the BBC Radiophonic Workshop there. Um, Joy Division's music was basically perfectly made perfectly conceived as a test bed for Martin Hannett's production techniques. Um, they composed from the rhythm section upwards which lent itself particularly to adding trimmings on so it, as, as it were later on in the in the studio um, layering different tracks of bass either in octaves or in fifths or playing contrapunctual harmonies against each other that's something that Martin Annett was particularly pushing Peter Hook to do using the studio as an instrument is probably one of the things that he himself is most famous for. So this is not really meant to be a how-to kit on how to reproduce sounds which are dead. It's more, hopefully you can take some inspiration from the approach that Martin Hannett had to making, to making music. If you're making music by yourself, you are effectively Martin Hannett. 
you were in the producer's chair. Maybe you have to tell yourself to be subservient in other roles. Maybe you have to think about the order in which you record the instruments. After all, many of us, I'm sure, are guitarists and have the instinct to start with guitar. When, in fact, to start with bass and even two basses could work better for the song. And pretty much always deciding upon a tempo and feel is essential before you start to record. So, after this, what was being done was essentially window dressing for an empty picture. And a lot of what Martin Hannick was doing was filling in the canvas. And making sure that basically it wasn't possible that you could ever get bored listening to those Joy Division records. There's a lot going on in sort of hidden parts of the production. Okay, so thank you very much for watching. Um, do stay tuned for other videos. I'm going to be again on holiday for a week or two. So I'm uploading these videos as a two-parter. Um, and enjoy the summer. Thank you very much. Goodbye.